one wife at a time. It was practice in those days. If you look at King David, he had many wives. Now, whether I, you know what I'm saying. It, it's funny, but it ain't in a way. But that's the only place the Bible even mentions that. And he does mention another part in the scripture talks about that if uh, only way you can remarry is if the wife or your spouse dies. But that wasn't the context he was teaching in. He was trying to teach that you have to die out your old self to be married to the Lord. He said you can't be the man of two masters. And what he was using was he was trying to say just like the law does allow if your spouse dies you can remarry. You're, you're free to do that. And he said it's the same way that if we die out and we kill the old man in us, then the new man that comes up in us can marry the Lord and become his wife because we are the bride of Christ. So we're never forsaken because of our imperfections. The freezes can tell you all about going through things and people just uh, judgment and You'd be surprised when people go through things, people suddenly don't know you anymore or want to have anything to do with you anymore. I hate to even use the example, but this Murdoch fellow down there that supposedly killed his wife and son, you know, and they're, everybody's slowly distancing themselves from him now. All his buddies and all he used to bump elbows with and drink beer with, they're not hanging with him no more because of that which I guess you can't blame him in a way for something like what he did. But, you know, just because you've been through a nasty divorce doesn't mean God doesn't love you. And it doesn't mean that he intended you for little alone the rest of your life. You know, when does it end? You know, when does forgiveness come in and you move on with your life? Think about it for a minute. That's totally against the scriptures if you think about it. At some point, you ought to be able to be a renewed and move on with your life. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I think the definition for righteousness is when you're doing your best to live right. Does it mean you're going to get it right every time? No. And if you come in here with those expectations that I've got to get it right every time and I'm never going to mess up, I'm never going to maybe get mad and swear. I've, I've known people to do that that lived for the Lord for three or four years and they got into an altercation somewhere and a three curse words come out and it condemned them so bad they didn't feel like they could even walk in the church, much less go in there and sit down as a member anymore because they had said three curse words on Thursday. That ain't how it works in God's house. Religion works that way, but not in his house. In his house, you'll find redemption, you'll find mercy, you'll find grace, he just don't like it when we try to hide stuff or maybe deny something. I'd rather just be frank with him and straight up, I'm struggling with this, Lord. I'm struggling with that, Lord. I'm struggling with this, you know, and just be honest with you. I need your help, Lord, to help me walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh. The devil will lie to us, and he wants us to believe that salvation is unsustainable. He really does. He'll lie to you and tell you you've sinned and you can't never get back to where you once was. You've lost ground. You'll never get back. That's a lie. What did I tell you the Bible said? The Bible said to restore those that have fallen with meekness. Restore means to put them back just like they were, right? They're not of a lesser value, right? We're, we're not discounted now because we've sinned or messed up. We're just a human being that God created us this way, that we're totally dependent upon him. I believe if we could reach a place of perfection, we would get to where we didn't need God. Man, I don't ever need to get to a place where I think I don't need him anymore. I need him every day. 
You know, it's just, un you can't sustain this thing. So all of you that's in here tonight need to understand that there'll come a day in your life when you may slip and say a curse word or do something that maybe the Lord isn't pleased about. But don't condemn yourself about it. Let conviction set in and let it do its work and come back to church. And talk. You don't even have to come to church to do it. Talk to him down by your bedside or going down the road in the car. I've had many a conversation going down the road in the car, you know, just, Lord, I need some help. Lord, I need some strength. Lord, I feel like I'm not praying like I should. You know, I feel like I'm not fasting like I should. I feel like I'm just not as close to you as I need to be. And if there's anybody in here that hadn't ever neglected their prayer life, I just don't know. You're probably storying. <laughs> it is so easy to get caught up in everyday life and realize, oh, my I haven't prayed today, or I didn't pray the last two days. But that didn't mean God wasn't on my mind. It didn't mean that I sinned necessarily. It doesn't mean God's going to be mad at me when I try to talk to him, that he's going to be closed mouth and tight-lipped and not hear my prayers anymore because I forgot to talk to him for two days. There's sometimes God doesn't talk back to me. He just listens. There's been times as a pastor or as a minister when I've got up to the pulpit on Sunday morning and he gave me no message except just preach my word. And you had to just look at his word and, and use the word to preach. But then there's other times he free and clear, you know what message he wants to give to the people that day. But every now and then he'll give you nothing. Except, you know my word, just preach my word today. I shouldn't have to tell you everything, right? And he doesn't say anything. So even he sometimes gets tight-lipped on us and doesn't say anything back, but that doesn't mean he's not hearing our prayers. Just because we don't get an audible voice back does not mean he doesn't hear us. You see, grace tolerates us when we fall short, and we're never perfect 100% of the time. I just want you, you need to write that down in your Bible. Put it on your refrigerator that I'm not always perfect, that I don't always get it all right. I don't always do everything that I'm supposed to do. I don't always pray long enough. I don't know, you know, how long is long enough for a prayer? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say, does it? Some people can pray for five minutes and get more done than somebody can in 30 minutes. You know what I'm saying? And I've seen churches before where people just got so accustomed to coming to church, they just pray to the same prayer they prayed last week in the same place and at the altar, sit in the same place, and they get in a rut. And then after a while, they wonder what's gone wrong. You know what I mean? And, and then that condemnation sets in. And Lord have mercy if you slip and somebody finds out about it and they tell the whole church about it. It's amazing how sin, bad news travels fast, doesn't it? Good news is slow. But we're not God's forsaken children. Many are lost because they simply give up. I mean, there's been times in my life that I felt like maybe I didn't pastor like I should. Maybe I missed a mark somewhere. Every time a minister comes down from preaching, immediately, there's a spirit of almost uh, condemnation comes over you that maybe you preach too hard to the people. Maybe you hurt somebody's feelings. Maybe I ran somebody off today. I hope not. You know, maybe I said something a little too strong. Maybe I didn't say something strong enough, you know, and you start questioning yourself on the way home. And then you get home and you beat yourself up, you know, and you're wondering, you know, did I get it right today? You know, I didn't really get a confirmation on the message today. I felt like this is what God gave me, but I just, you know, it didn't get confirmed exactly like a lot of times. You know, I've had messages before and somebody walk up to me before church and say something that would be right along with what I was going to preach. I'm saying, well, I found it today. And I'm sure there's been times when I missed it because it is so easy for the human nature to kick in in the pulpit. And, and me, me start talking. That's dangerous. You know what I mean? You never, I've always been taught, you don't handle problems in the pulpit. 
You just preach the word. Preach whatever he gives you for that week and, and admonish the people. Seldom is God going to beat up on his people. Yes, he will correct us, but he does it with love and with patience and with long suffering, okay? He's not going to condemn you to hell, okay? The hell's not designed for us anyway. It was designed for the devil and his angels. That lake of fire was not designed for us to go into. And he doesn't wish that any should perish, the Bible says, but that all would come to repentance. And, you know, repentance is an everyday thing. It ain't a one-time deal. A lot of people think, well, oh, man, I, I repented May the 9th, 1990, and, and I hadn't repented since because I thought I had to keep it right. And then you feel shut out. And then you feel more and more disconnected from the body. And you don't need to do that. You need to stay connected at all costs. You have to be careful. Your mind will run crazy sometimes because I didn't live up to the church's expectations. That young lady playing the piano, she didn't live up to somebody's expectations there that day. And they pitched a fit with the preacher, and the preacher sat the young lady down for three months, and of course it knocked the wind out of her sails, and she felt like she could never get back to where she was at, so she didn't have no desire to even play it anymore. Had the talent and the ability, but they took that desire away because they judged her. It's not, listen, even the preacher don't judge. <laughs> yep, that's right. right well I'll, I'll be a little transparent here for a minute uh, when me and her first got in church we were living together and the preacher didn't condemn me he invited me into the church he found out I could play a guitar he said why don't you get bring your guitar to church and play and be a part of us and him doing that and embracing me made me go back to him and say, look, I've been living with this lady, but I need to marry her because it's an embarrassment to her and me that we're living together, and we ought not to be doing that. So will you marry us? And he said, I most certainly will. But if he had stuck his nose up in the air and said, well, you know, you can't use you. You know, I was in a meeting one time in a church, and they called a business meeting, and they said something about if you didn't have the Holy Ghost, you couldn't be in the meeting. I thought, well, wait a minute now. I put my, my money in the plate. You can use that. You don't mind me driving nails up on the roof, but you want to exclude me from the meeting because I hadn't uh, met up to your expectations of what you call getting the Holy Ghost, okay? Uh, there's many definitions of what people think when someone's got it or not. You know what? I don't worry about it. I just let you come down there and do your best. And I want to pray with you and ag you on or whatever and give you the confidence to keep going. And if you didn't get it that time, you'll get it next time. We just keep trying. You know what I mean? And it don't come upon everybody the same way. Right. Yep. Oh, they were real quick to let me and her know we couldn't come to that meeting. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Usually, I think a lot of times judgment starts in the way the preaching is. And then people pick up on that, and then they start doing the same thing because they think they're holier than thou. Uh, just like that day the preacher called that meeting, I could tell there was some of them in there turning around like, you know, y'all know y'all can't be in this meeting, you know. And I, I, didn't let it, yeah, I didn't let it get to me, but it did bother me a little bit uh, that they would single us out like that, you know. I mean, man, I was mowing the grass around there and doing what I thought I was supposed to do, you know, and trying to be a part. And 
So, uh, yeah, it was definitely directed. And what happens then, the people start acting like that. And the next thing you know, they're judging one another. And it gets us in trouble when we start doing those things. We just need to come to church. And if, and if somebody over there is struggling with something, pray for them. Lord, have mercy. Don't call up somebody on the hotline and tell them all their business. You got something? They do it so you'll be on the recording. My first thought was I bet there are a lot of people that are thinking, well, somebody's going to come in and they're going to flaunt their sin. And truthfully, it doesn't matter. If God's in this church, if the Holy Ghost is in this church, and even if somebody's seeking God and not, you know, hey, I don't know I'm doing wrong, God will take care of it. In his time, the only commandment that we have to obey is to love one another. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, as soon as you said it, I just got a picture in my mind of people being afraid about people coming in like that. And, you know, God just quickened me. Don't worry about it. God's God. He's still on the throne. We're not. That's right. That's for sure. He's on the throne and he it's his church. And we're all equal. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 and 2, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. He says, By which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, he says. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8 it says and god is able to make all grace abound toward you everybody say that means me that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work when you read and study the bible closely it doesn't condemn people it teaches people and i have found in 28 years of pastoring here that if you usually just get up and preach the love of God and the things that's in the Bible without tearing people down, the Spirit will bring conviction, and they will, will change slowly at different levels. This little boy here may walk at two years old. Another child in here may not walk till they're three years old. Some of them may not start walking and talking till they're four years old. Everybody grows at different rates. There's no model that we go by or a mold that we can put people into because God doesn't work that way at all. We're never to a point, and you remember this, you are never ever to a point to where you can't ascend the throne of God. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 tells us this. They say the apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Many people differ, I don't know. All I know is it was written to the Jews, but it says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Man, I don't need judgment when I'm struggling with something. I need somebody that understands. And Jesus understands what it's like. I think that's why he walked on earth for 33 years, is we can't ever stand before him and him not be able to relate to what it was like to be tempted it says he was tempted in all ways, yet was without sin. But we're not like he was until we get the Spirit in us. And then we become the sons and daughters of God. And we use the Spirit. To, what's the, In the book of John, I think chapters 15 and 16 talks about the Spirit of truth. Uh, same thing as the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit. It says it will lead and guide us into all truth. So you can't really know and feel the things of God without him in you, guiding you. And then you couple that up with the preached word, and that's how we go from A to Z. And that's how we get out of here one of these days, and not by judgment and all of these things. That's why the church is so unpopular today, and it's so difficult to get people to come to church because of the judgment within the church. If we just get people to come to church and act right, 
act right toward one another. It's like I said, we are never and we are not banished from God's mercy and grace. Only man tries to put stipulations on us. Not the Bible does. It doesn't judge us in that way. It says we're never to a point of no return as long as we live. There's always room for repentance. There's always room for the grace of God and the mercy of God to work in our lives. Have you ever had the devil beat you up over your past? You know, you're sitting in church doing pretty good, and all of a sudden you get to thinking about what you used to be. And thinking, oh, my God, you know, man, these people up here, they were born and raised in this thing. Seth don't have a clue what it's like to, to struggle like I've struggled. You know, he may not exactly, but you know what? It's all a level playing field in God's house. And it doesn't matter where we've been. It's all about where we're going. It says he casts our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. So we're not banished, and it's never too late to ascend the throne of God and plead, as they used to say when I was a deputy, no low contendere. You plead that, that means I plead the mercy of the court. to have mercy on me with this. I'm pleading guilty and on the mercy of the court. And we need to plead that with him every day. That, Lord, I, here I am, Lord. I'm not infallible, Lord. I'm not perfect, Lord. I don't know. Sometimes I slip and don't even know it and don't even realize it until it's after someone else has reminded me of it, you know. <laughs> but I'm sorry. And here I am, Lord. We're taking mold and make me, Lord. And I may fail again tomorrow, but I'm going to get back up. Why? Because I can, and I know the mercy of God's there. I don't know, it's, it's bothered me over the years that people would come and think there was no mercy and grace and they leave hopeless. Man, I'm going to tell you what, that's an awful place to find yourself is in a hopeless situation where you feel like you, you can't better yourself, you can't come out of it, you can't get beyond your past. Yes, you can. Yeah, that's one good thing I love about Jesus is he don't care about my past. It's all under the blood. It says he bought me with his blood and paid for me. I'm his son. She's his daughter, and he loves us. God doesn't tear up our birth certificate when we fall short. He doesn't divorce us when we don't act just right. He, he works with us through the preached word. That's why we have the five-fold ministry. It's to edify the church. It's to help us along. We're not going to beat little Nathan to death because he's messed up and wrote with a crayon all over the wall. We're going to teach him not to do it. And we're going to do it with patience. And we're going to do it with understanding and with love. And he's going to understand why he got disciplined in these things. We're not going to go into a fit of rage because that isn't the way the Lord works at all. We never go beyond God's saving grace. You hear that? We never go beyond the love of God. Y'all hear that? Remember John 3 and 16 through 18. Some of the best verses of Scripture you could ever read. It says, For God so loved the world. You've got to understand, he says he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but he sent the world through him, but that, through, that the world through him might be saved. It says he come to give us life and life more abundantly. He didn't come to throw us under the bus. He didn't come to line us all up and point out our faults and failures and all these things and tell us we're going to go to hell if we don't straighten up. But his mercy and his long sufferings there, and I said this here a while back, I believe that judgment will be on different levels according to people's knowledge. I don't know that God could judge him on the same level as he could me. He don't know what baptism's about. He don't know what repentance is about. He has no idea. But I do. And once we know these things, then we're kind of held accountable and we need to do the things that we know to do right or at least be striving to do those things, working toward perfection, right? That's what we need to do, not condemn one another. Do you ever think that you fail God so much that his mercy won't work for you anymore? I can just tell you, you're not cast aside or forsaken. That's one thing we are not here tonight, and we're not ever going to be. If we go to the lake of fire, it'll be because we chose to go there. 
Do you hear that? It'll be because you chose to go there. Because I can tell you right now, his mercy and his grace is in this church, and it's working for you. All you've got to do is have a little talk with Jesus as the song goes, and everything's going to be all right. Just have that little talk with him, and everything's going to be all right. You've got to get it in your head that you're not perfect. Probably never, ever will be. We're all human. And we're all totally dependent upon the Lord for our daily lives. We live one day at a time, folks. Not days at a time, but one day at a time. Yesterday's in the history books. There's no promise of tomorrow till it gets here. Isn't that right? We'll deal with tomorrow when it gets here. But for right now, I'm going to deal with the now. And I promise you that I'm going to live in the now and I don't understand that I am totally dependent upon God's grace and mercy that he will never, ever cast me aside and forsake me. Not that I have, but I can understand how someone who could come into church and all of a sudden they, they backslide. Maybe they go back into their uh, drug-induced uh, lifestyle. They can become ill in their thoughts and their mind process oh, yeah. where they can uh, feel less than. They can, their self-worth can be just thrown in the trash because when you're um, on drugs... And I'm, I, you know, I don't know if anyone can relate with me, but when you're on drugs, your self worth gets thrown in the trash. Oh yeah. And um, that's why I think it's very important that, like, if we ever see someone that you know has a spark in their eye for God, wants to start living for God, and you know that they're struggling with drugs, it, we need to go that extra yard with them because, I mean. It's just like, it's easy. Oh, for being me a second relate. mile Christian. It's easy for me to relate to someone like that. Like earlier, you said, you know, you hear pastors preach on areas where they uh, might have a, a problem with. It's because they're qualified. They're qualified right. experts in that area. Well, you know, I'm kind of a qualified expert in that area. Thank <laughs> you, Lord. I was delivered. But I, I can see people hurting that way. And. You know, you got to do more than just tell them, oh, God's got you. You got to show them by example. And you know, a lot of that happens on Sunday morning when people walk through the door and you get up out of your chair and go shake their hand, tell them, I'm glad you're here. I love you. I missed you. Glad you're back from Peru okay. You know, you didn't get sick. I don't think you did. And had a, had a good fruitful tour down there again. And, you know, people, you know, a lot of times we're, we're, more apt to sit in our seats and not really interact too much. But, you know, we visited a church two weeks ago. Well, it was last a week ago Friday, wasn't it? And uh, in North Carolina, we went to this men's conference. And, man, in the parking lot, they were meeting us, shaking our hands and giving us a hug and telling them they were telling us they were so glad we were there, you know, and they didn't dress us down on how we looked and what have you, you know. But they, and I'm talking about all the way into this place. I think by the time I got to my chair, 15 people had shook my hand, told me they, I didn't even know them. They told me they loved me, glad I was there, and just wanted us to come be a part of what we're doing here. And I'm thinking that's what the ark needs to be like, that when people come through the door, we don't know what somebody's been through that week. You know, we don't know what they've slipped at or are struggling with, you know, and they got the courage up to come, you know, and, and they're just hoping somebody will come up to them and give them some confidence. You know what I'm saying? Because they're already self-condemned. But just you going to them and shaking their hand, I'm so glad you're here. Man, that just, all of that wall comes down. All that condemnation comes down. And they feel like, you know what, I think I can do this. I think I can do this. safe, yeah. but knowing that they needed to escape the life that they're in. They come on in, 
And if we don't greet them, if they just sat down, they might have heard a good message. But if they sit there and feel isolated, you know, do you think they're going to feel comfortable mm. to come back the second time? No, but if you can go and say, hey, you know what? Hey, what's your name? Da, 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 da. Nice to meet you. Good. Just like you're saying, Bishop, you know, it's, it, it goes a long way. And is it really that hard for us to step out of ourselves for a moment yeah. and do that? We have. Uh, I'm closing. Um, I'll take some more questions, more comments, whatever. We had a lady here one time that had a certain seat. And if someone came in and sat in her seat, she'd get mad and go all the way to the back of the church. She eventually quit coming because people would sit in her chair. Now, now we got we got probably 200 seats out there, or 150. You know, maybe a half of them's filled. And she'd get upset. Matter of fact, she'd come to me all the way up to the platform and told me I needed to go tell that person to move. They were sitting in her chair. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy. That's the last thing they needed, you know, is for somebody to do that or for everybody in the church. Is, you know, sometimes you go in a restaurant around here, and when you come in the door, everybody will go. <laughs> you know, you ever seen that happen? Manning's good for that, you know. Wonder what they do. That's that, that's that Pentecostal preacher, you know. That's his wife, you know. Wonder what they doing in here, you know. Uh, you know, I heard they was a cult and all this stuff, you know. <laughs> You'd be surprised the things that go on, the things that's been said and told, and people run with it. And, but, you know, like I said, people need us to love on them when they come to church regardless of their race, regardless of where they come from, regardless of their background, regardless of what they look like. They, you know, they need, they're, they're human beings, and they're hurting on the inside, and they're, they're wanting to find salvation. They're wanting to find the love of God, not the judgment of God. That's coming when it's all over with. You know, they don't need it right now. They need somebody to point them in the right direction, and the way we do that is by example. And when you love on them people, you see, God will love them through us. And that's what they need. That's what I needed when I walked into that little church on South Main Street in 1990 with my girlfriend. I needed to find the love of God was what I was looking for. I was looking for somewhere that would accept me. And they did. They used me. They accepted me. I knew I need, didn't need to be living together. They didn't. I didn't need that preached to me. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't stupid. You know, I knew we didn't need to be doing that. But they, at the time, there was nowhere else for it to go. And even if there was, I probably wouldn't have put her out. You know what I mean? That was just my mindset in them days. <laughs> Anybody got anything else you want to? Fifty cents worth you want to put in? The word I was just reading in Hebrews 4 and 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When we use the word to divide somebody, we're literally saying, I'm God. And I'm going to fix you. And we're, that's not our job. We're completely out of our lane in, when we do that. And when we think of ourselves, just, just think about this. You know, you're not going to tear somebody else down. But when you tear yourself down, you are literally destroying God's creation with your words to yourself. And we've got to remember that that's where a lot of that that expectation you know um the place between expectation and reality is where we get messed up that's where we disappoint ourselves because we expect ourselves to be perfect we expect i'll never fall or, or we look at these other people in our lives and we say oh i could never be as spiritual as you know bishop or i could never be as spiritual as this one or i could never pray like that you are tearing down yourself in that way and we can't you know we're it just it it's a it's a disappointment to God because 
he wants he doesn't want you to look at what you're not he wants you to look at what you are in him and what you can be yes absolutely through Christ that strengthens you absolutely so remember that about yourself when you you know I can't do this or I'll never do that be careful because you know you're dividing your own self and and you're you're actually using satanic language to do it you know satan is the one that's the accuser of the brethren right so you know we're putting ourselves in his shoes when we accuse each other and you know we don't need to do that we need to remember that that god is the one we serve and even with ourselves we have to say you know what i did not do as well as i thought i would should have done last week but today's a new day and i've got every opportunity to do better you know, but always strive to do that, to do better. Amen. Anybody got anything else? Put limitations on what I can and can't do. And I, I know I'm a victim of that, you know, and by me serving God with all my heart, you know, by me saying that I have a limitation, it's also me acknowledging the fact that God has a limitation when he doesn't have a limitation, and if we're truly seeking, we've got to say that, well, y you know, then maybe I don't have a limitation. Right. You know, and it, it, people, we always want to live, oh, I can't do that, I can't do it, just like you, what you're saying, kind of. Um, we just all could do more. I want to live up to his potential in my life, and it's just that potential is limitless. Yeah. Could you imagine if Jill went down to Peru and you went down and started telling them all that was wrong? <laughs> I mean, you know, if you started pulling them aside and pointing out this is wrong, that's wrong, man, they not they gone. Yeah, you not you're not going to win anybody that way. But you know, you bring the spirit with you, the spirit who you hope's there too, and let it do the work. And even in our own lives, yield yourself. Don't think you're you're too less to be a Sunday school teacher or a preacher or getting up and teaching a class. Any of y'all can get up out here and teach a class. You know, all of us has done been down the road and back quite a way. We've made mistakes, and as we get older, we have more wisdom. And, and, and we, our wisdom comes from our mistakes. What does it say by the blood of the Lamb and our testimony is how we overcome? Well, our testimony is where I've took tests and failed. Uh, how do you know unless you try something, you know, and then you mess up and then you realize, you know what, I, that didn't work out too good, so I can teach others that. And they'll learn a whole lot quicker from that type of teaching than they will trying to con make them feel condemned. I don't like preaching where you drive everybody in the altar with fear. That isn't God's way of doing things. He'll love you into the altar, not condemn you into the altar. That's all I got today. You want to close us out? Yes, yes. I think we've got some that are... Uh, Yep, I think we've got some that are...